all yours, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. I would like each and every one of you to know that I feel so privileged to make this award the freedom of flight. I think and have been thinking as we've been watching the program develop here. You know, the first hundred years of aviation from wood and fabric type airplanes from the Wright Brothers Day, we accomplished an enormous amount, but it took us a hundred years plus to get where we were before the space program came into effect. Well, one of those explorers was Neil Armstrong as a test pilot. The X-15 was designed by North American Aviation to go out of the sensible atmosphere. We had explored the sensible atmosphere, and we lost a lot of lives in accomplishing that exploration. And in a very short time, 10 years period, when the decision was made to put man on the moon, it was a whole new evolution. But it started from sensible atmosphere to out to the sphere beyond that, where you're getting close to getting away from the gravitation of the Earth and the sphere of survivable atmosphere. Well, Neil Armstrong was on that X-15 program, as you saw earlier. Neil was undaunted. I must tell you, that airplane had to, had to be built very strong because the temperature that they reached was at Mach 0.6 was 3,500 degrees of temperature on that airplane, all leading edges. That X-15 was designed with skis because the rubber would melt if it were tires. The nose wheel was a wheel and tire surrounded by a cooling factor so that the rubber would not melt away. And the reason for that type of design was that the angle of attack at the airplane without flaps, when it come into land, you'd end up like this, and when the skis would touch down, the nose would come down with a slap down effect. And on one of the test flights, the fuselage broke just behind the cockpit because the pilot on that particular flight was unable to jettison his fuel when his rocket did, ignite, did not ignite. And so he was landing way over the gross weight for the design on landing. That was just one of the stepping stones. It was another where the airplane was blown up, and absolutely you wouldn't have dreamed anybody could have survived it, but we had an inert in that atmosphere of nitrogen, so that sitting in the middle of this fireball, he didn't get injured at all. Well, Neil came along, and he was on one of his flights. Uh, he encountered a problem. They released him at the wrong place, and there's a term in flight tests called high coefficient of lift. And it, 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 we, they call it CL max for short. But what it means is that the pilot has to be so skilled that when he comes in on his landing approach, he skims across the edge of the lake bed and holds it off so that he's getting the maximum coefficient of lift because of his sensitivity on the controls. Neil did just that. But for those of us who were monitoring it from the control, it looked like he was never going to make it. But because of his expertise, he got the most magnificent lift out of that right until the touchdown, and he was saved. But it was a high-risk flight. Jumping from there to the insensible atmosphere of space was the greatest exploration we've ever had. It was accomplished in, I mentioned, 10 years. Well, Neil had his share, as did each of the astronauts, of trying to think ahead, anticipating what kind of difficulty will we encounter. And it was unknown, totally unknown. And remember, 
you were on an umbilical cord, so to speak, in space because you had to carry your own life support. And for those of you who've never worn a pressure suit, it's the most uncomfortable garment that you have ever worn when it's under pressure. And I mean, it freezes you just like that. And where you could normally bend your elbows or your knees or sit down, uh-uh, it's very difficult because you are fighting everything that seems to be against you. And it's really a, an enormous pressure. And of course, you had to have that life support line if you were outside of the, the space vehicle. But each and every mission was faced with hazard and the unknown. And yet they progressed monumentally on every mission until the final day and Neil made that great step on the moon. Well, that was just the beginning. Neil established it. We'll remember him forever and always. But there's one more thing on his trip to the moon. The landing, lunar landing module that made him able to descend and land on the surface of the moon. The only way that we could know what was required of a man was to be able to build a simulated model and it looked like a, a bed post vehicle. It didn't have any wings or anything on it, but it had rocket thrusters. And Neil was testing this and it was about 20 feet above in the vertical like this and just practicing going up and down and, and, and making what necessary corrections had to be made to land on a given spot. Well, in this one instance, he had a thrust to fail. And I want to tell you how, show you how quick he was. And I'm talking about milliseconds, milliseconds. That airplane went, or not an airplane, that vehicle went from here to here. And it's a snap of your finger almost. But Neil realized exactly what was happening here as, it, as he had the failure on the thruster. And the airplanes did this. He punched out, pulled his ejection seat out. Out he went. And he went straight out like this. The canopy opened. And he swung back on the ground. I could not believe that he survived. If you would have seen those pictures, you would never have believed it. But he did survive. And he had that same sort of thing happen. I believe it was on the Gemini program. Uh, he had a, thr a thruster stick. And his ingenuity, again, saved the day because he was about to become incapacitated from the rapid rotation rate. And he caught it just in time. And these things had to happen quickly. So most people do not realize that there was one factor for us being test pilots in that sensible atmosphere, but exploring the unknown they faced hazardous that you wouldn't even dream of. And they did it in a short time period, did it successfully, and with the smallest number of the loss of lives of any, any major exploration we've ever had in our history. Well, it, it's really my pleasure, pleasure to to make this award to Neil and to Gene Cernan, the first and the last man on the moon. And when I think about my friend Gene Cernan, he had more obstacles than most would ever dream of, but he had an objective. He wanted to become an astronaut, and he was willing to sacrifice his whole way of life, as did each of the astronauts. They were committed to studying and learning things that they'd never thought of in their lives. They had to, had to study geology. They were away from home continuously. Oh, the test pilots were like that. We, we'd be going home and having a drink with the family if we survived the day. But boy, they, they can't come home. And when they did get back from space, 
they were spending all of their time training for the next mission and trying to foresee what they might anticipate in this further exploration. Well, in, in Gene's case, he had one right after the other. I mentioned the pressure suit problem. Well, Gene, on one of his uh, walks in space, he had a long tether, and he went out to the end of it, and they had not yet put hand holes. So here he is, out on this tether, with that just life support, back into the vehicle, he left. And while he was out there, he didn't have anything to hang on, nothing to do. And if any of you have ever seen a garden hose in a swimming pool and you turn the water on, it goes like this, back and forth. Well, that's what happened to Gene Cernan. He was out there going around like this, and he couldn't, he had nothing to hang on to. So he worked his way back up and grabbed whatever he could. But then the problem was trying to get back into the Apollo. And it was almost physically impossible. And the exertion required used up about every bit of energy that he had. And this, this happened with many others too, but not to the extent that it occurred with, with Gene. They put handles out there so you could, when you got near, you could grab it and hang on. But just imagine just being out there tossed around like so. Well, I, I want to digress a little bit. You know, everybody that ever was in military flight training had one big goal, and that was getting the gold or silver wings on your uniform. And then the next thing that would normally happen to a, a young guy who once got the wings was to consider, boy, wouldn't it be nice to have a convertible? <laughs> and so most, most of those people who had just been a cadet and promoted to an officer, right? They spent their money and got a hawk over getting the money to acquire a convert. Well, you know, it took Gene a long time to accomplish that. First thing he accomplished, he was the youngest Navy officer to ever make the rank of captain. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with, with ranks, in the different services, the Navy is the only one that calls a colonel a captain, but that's the Navy's way of uh, discussing a man's rank within the service. But it is equivalent to a full colonel in the, any other branch of the service. Well, he did that. He was, he was ahead of everybody. But the other thing was, he has had the unique career of driving the most expensive convertible man has ever seen. And you know what? He not only drove the vehicle, but he drove it further than anybody else and spent more time driving it than anybody else. And he brought back the heaviest load of geological specimens than anybody else in that convertible. It was named the Lunar Rover. I would like to present to you, Carol, would you, Rick and Mike, please join me here. And Gene Cernan, my dear friend, please help me. Okay. Are they with me? <laughs> Excuse me, Carol, I can't turn my head too far. Thank you so much for being with us. This is a real treat for everyone here. And Rick and Mark, how wonderful of you to come out for this celebration. My friend Gene Cernan and I enjoyed so many times in our life visiting with the great Neil Armstrong. 
And I present this to you, Kara, and to you, Gene Cernan. Here's to James. Bob, here's James. Yeah. Yeah, you. That's for you, pal. Love you, Mark. Thank you. As you all probably know, Dad had a lifelong love of aviation. He has received a few medals and awards over the years. Okay, well, more than a few. <laughs> but I have no doubt that he would have considered receiving this award from Bob, whom he admired greatly, to be very, very special, and he would have been really proud. Receiving it in the company of so many of his fellow pilots, aviation pioneers, and most importantly, his friends, it's been tremendously meaningful for us. So to everyone in the living legends of aviation and the uh, Kitty Hawk Air Academy, please accept our sincere gratitude for allowing us the honor and the privilege of receiving this award on Dad's behalf. Thank you. It's no secret that Dad uh, tended to, to shy away from individual awards. And to be honest, he was never much for the red carpet. But he had agreed to attend tonight, and it's not hard to see why. Undoubtedly, the combination of, of seeing so many friends, of receiving this award from the legendary Bob Hoover, and the opportunity, and the opportunity to talk about flying with so many kindred spirits, well, that simply that won him over. We all, we all live and learn. If I had only realized that talking about airplanes was the key to getting my dad to acquiesce, <laughs> well, let's just say I could have avoided any number of losing arguments when I was much younger. Thank you for honoring our father and his good friend, Gene Cernan and for allowing us to participate. Ladies and gentlemen, evening is long. It's been a great evening. Uh, I guess I'm the end of the show, Robert. But I'm accustomed to being last, as you might well imagine. <laughs> I got to tell you, it is a special tribute to, but equally humbly, to be on the stage with Bob Hoover. <laughs> who really defined the meeting, what a living legend is all about. And it's all also humbling to be mentioned at the same time in the same phrase, in the same paragraph, coming from the mouth of Bob Hoover with the name of a dear friend and a colleague, Neil Armstrong. His name and his accomplishments, I can promise you, in all due respect to everyone in this audience, will live long after you and I have passed on to another world. So this is special. But I speak for a minute about 
Neil and myself and our uh, and, and what we've been able to do, we stood on the shoulders, you've heard it before, we stood on the shoulders of giants. They're giants of a nation of people who believed that they could. And many of those giants have been honored here tonight and the rest of them are in this audience with us this evening. And that's how we were able to indeed live the dreams that we had as children in reaching for the stars. The challenge I offer you is a challenge to provide the opportunities that those of us in this room have had in our life to our children, our grandchildren, and theirs to provide the shoulders for them to stand on so they too can reach for their dreams. Bobby, Robert, Bob. Thank you. This is truly a special tribute, and I, can, I, I will forever hold the name of Robert Hoover very close to my heart. God bless.